Well, okay, well, I have uh, the daunting task of finishing uh, a dissection talk in about eight minutes. So just so I know how fast I can go, how many of you are familiar with dissections? How many of you are very familiar with dissections? Oof. Well, we'll go as fast as we can. Uh, and if you guys have questions between um, or during some of the breaks, you're welcome to come and ask me questions. So dissection definitions, there are basically some very simple uh, definitions, acute, uh, essentially diagnosed within the first 14 days of symptom onset and chronic, everything after that. That's based on really old uh, anatomical data from uh, cadaveric uh, uh, specimens. Um, essentially complicated dissection, end organ ischemia or malperfusion, you know that, refractory hypertension, rupture or impending rupture, uncontrollable pain. I'll come back to some of those things throughout the talk. And then of course you have your uncomplicated dissections. There are really only two classifications I think you really need to know. Uh, the Stanford and DeBakey classification. Stanford makes it very easy. Uh, type A is everything that it involves the ascending, uh, and type B e is from the left subclavian down. And then you have the DeBakey classification, which is um, one, which involves everything, two, just the ascending. You really see very few of those. I think um, probably a lot of those that we used to qualify as type twos before are probably a imaging uh, misnomer. So we didn't have good imaging before and there was this classification. Um, they're essentially treated the same way. The ascending is repaired. Um, and then um, you have the type threes, which are essentially the equivalent to your uh, DeBakey type Bs. Uh, demographics, 80 to 90% uh, are more than 60 years of age uh, and have uh, arterial hypertension. Uh, acute dissections involved the ascending tend to be younger, uh, so probably about an uh, eight-year difference. Uh, arch vessel occlusion uh, causes stroke in 5 to 10% of patients with type A. Um, one leg is more commonly affected than, uh, than the other, and that's the left, uh, which is usually the false lumen, um, and that usually will become uh, suddenly uh, numb and pale, pulseless, pulseless and, and you can oftentimes, if it's, a, if it's a type A dissection, you can fix the type A portion and that'll fix itself. It's about changing the pressures in the false and true lumen. Uh, and then, of course, you have your uh, renal ins insults. Uh, sudden death uh, can be the presenting feature uh, with free rupture of the false channel, although that's not commonly so. Uh, most of those patients won't make it to the hospital. Uh, hypovolemic shock, uh, loss of blood from the false uh, channel into the periaortic tissues, uh, acute aortic insufficiency, and cardiac tamponade. Uh, type A's, all emergencies. Remember always this, it's very easy, 1% per hour um, a mortality rate uh, for the first 48 hours. Uh, so you can see the mortality is pretty high for type A's if they are left untreated. Uh, operative repair, about a 30% mortality uh, involved with that. Um, it's essentially it's just an ascending replacement. Uh, sometimes the valve is resuspended if there are issues with the valve. And the complications are self-evident. <clears throat> Uh, symptoms and signs, sudden back, uh, or severe chest pain, 90% of patients, pain into the belly, uh, despite it being a type A, obviously it extends all the way down, um, and you can have mesenteric ischemia and so on. Uh, hypertension, 70% uh, of the distal dissections, uh, less than 50% of the proximal ones. Uh, syncope in 50 to 20% 50 of patients with tamponade, carotid dissection, and paralysis. Imaging is really where everything has changed. And Dr. Lumsden already talked about imaging with, with respect to sort of 3D reconstructions and so on. But uh, I'll, I'll just take you through a few things real quick. Uh, of course, chest x-ray, you can see uh, some changes, a, a CT scan for type A's and B's, echoes, those are usually TEEs. On chest x-ray, you essentially see a wide mediastinum, um, a cardiomegaly secondary to pericardial effusion, although that's not the more common thing, and a prominent a aortic shadow. On echo, um, you can see obviously the, the dissection itself. Uh, you have to obviously sedate the patient, put the TE in, and have somebody who can do it. Uh, and that's what you would see in the ASEN, you would see a flap. Now obviously even with a TE, there are portions of the aorta you can't see. So you, you obviously need to get a better image uh, if you see that there's a, um, if there's a dissection. So CT scan is probably the most widely used diagnostic tool. And that's essentially because it's available everywhere. It's cheap, it's quick, um, but it does have lower sensitivity and specificity than either TEE or MRI. MRI has sort of become our preferred uh, modality here, although not for the emergencies because our MRI is done with the cardi uh, cardiologists and the cardiologists work different hours than we do. Most dissections seem to come in nighttime or inopportune moments on weekends. 
uh, when uh, they will usually be on the golf course or sipping a margarita by the poolside. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'll just go through some of the MRI stuff that we have. So just quickly from the IRAD registry, you can click, quickly see here that MRI is a very good tool. Um, and there are reasons why it's a good tool, but you have to know how to use it. Uh, MRI is all very user dependent. Uh, what's the rationale behind advanced imaging? Well, once the presence of dissection is established, and you can obviously do that with TE, what information do you actually need? You need to see what the extension of the dissection, extension of the dissection is. Uh, branch vessel involvement, proximal entry, distal re-entries, septal mobility and dynamic branch involvement, uh, true and false lumen uh, filling patterns, false lumen thrombosis, rupture, and aortic dimensions. If you look at a dissection, we always, you know, have always been used to looking at CAT scans, and they're a very static uh, picture. So you're actually only looking at one phase of the cardiac cycle. But a lot is happening in, in, in an aorta in general. And then imagine with a dissection, when you have a flap, there's even more happening. You can have both uh, static portions of, of a dissection flap, uh, for example, when the hematoma extends into a branch vessel, uh, and you can have both uh, dynamic components uh, or a combination thereof. And this is actually a very good example. I don't know if you guys can appreciate but here you're looking at a static picture, and then over here you'll see how with, uh, with each <coughs> cardiac cycle you see actually complete occlusion of the celiac and SMAs. And you know, I, I don't know maybe over time we'll see some, some uh, change in what we consider a complicated dissection, but in a patient who comes with abdominal pain, lactic acid is normal, and you see this, you know, in my, in my perspective I think I would be inclined to treat it. I bet most of you guys aren't seeing these kinds of images in your institutions. This is probably even more dramatic. You see really what the, what's happening to that septum, and you get a really good appreciation that there is some real mobility in all this and some real dynamic functions of, of the dissections. This actually was some work done some years ago, um, and it's actually still very relevant. So there are some benign ischemic configurations that can quickly key, uh, key you into whether there are some issues or not or some potential future issues. Um, I'm going to go through this real, real quick because we want you to get a break. Again, some very good um, MR images where you can kind of see uh, really the, define the anatomy pretty, pretty well. Let me go to the next one. Here you can see your entry and, uh, and, and re-entry tear uh, super well. You can kind of define that very well. We have essentially over time found three uh, types of flow patterns through these. This is actually MR angio. And what you can see in example one, basically the flow goes to the true and false lumen at the same rate. And these are essentially benign uh, dissections. They tend to not change over time. Then you have type two there, uh, where you essentially have flow through the true and false lumen initially at the same rate. But in, in the false lumen, there's no good re-entry tear, so it hangs up in that false lumen. And those tend to uh, probably progress towards um, uh, aneurysm degeneration. Like the ones in, in example three, except for in this case, it's a small, re -entry, small entry tear and a larger re-entry tear, so you get retrograde flow through that false lumen. Um, this is uh, dynamic CT, and you can get some amazing images with that, and kind of gives you the same information that you saw in some of those pictures for the MRI. Uh, the difference with this is it's ECG gated, so you have much higher dose of radiation, um, and in our institution at least, it's still affiliated with the cardiologist, and so the, the, the constraints of, of uh, times of the day still, still remain true. So one of the things you need to figure out is, is it an aortic dissection or is it an MI? Um, that's pretty important if you guys, um, uh, you know, see these patients in the ER. You want to be able to figure that out fairly quickly. Uh, and there are some ways and biomarkers that will allow you to do that. And a pretty good study which showed that essentially uh, if you have a D-dimer that's less than 500, um, you can rule out aortic dissection uh, and pulmonary embolism. If it's higher, then you probably need to do a confirm confirmatory test. Now, most of us don't do that, and we don't even do it, but it's, it's a pretty good screening tool. Uh, as far as type B dissections, uh, essentially pain control and anti-impulse th therapy. Um, you, want, you want to convert to PO medications as soon as you can, and then discharge an anti-hypertensives, uh, CT Q3 months uh, times four, Q6 months times two, and then Q12 months thereafter. Uh, and we already talked about the indications for intervention. Uh, in the chronic phase, aneurysmal degeneration of the outer wall uh, false lumen is the primary late complication. 
Um, and then you want to know that over, you know, over the time, 40 to 50 percent of them will require aneurysm resection. This is basically the therapeutic spectrum. So type A's, we know that they're all treated open uh, right now. And you know, it may be that down the road we treat them uh, by endovascular means. But right now, this remains the, 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 uh, the way to treat them. And then medical therapy. Um, for essentially uncomplicated type Bs, uh, stable, isolated aortic arch uh, dissections, and chronic type Bs. Uh, and then interventional for, uh, for all the ones, that the indications we spoke about earlier, uh, hybrid procedures for extended type As, and then stable type B um, aortic dissections. Now, most places, probably including your places, um, really favor a complication-specific approach for type B aortic dissections. Uh, with medical antihypertensive treatment. And that's going to be the mainstay for all your patients, no matter what you do, whether you're going to then go put a stent graft or not. Uh, contemporary operative mortality rates of elective surgery range between 0 and 27%. And that's in probably in the institutions like Dr. Lumsden mentioned that are high volume. But in the small institutions where you're doing these on an occasional basis, uh, the mortality probably exceeds that and up to 50% or more, um, and, and particularly so under emergency conditions. Third available treatment, TVAR, essentially propelled by the desire to induce aortic remodeling by sealing the proximal entry tear. Uh, operative results of type B, uh, the overall in hospital mortality is pretty high, 29.3%. Uh, if surgery is performed in less than 48 hours, it's higher and lower once you go into more of a chronic phase. So why do we treat? If you look at um, the, uh, the graph on your left there, or is it on your right? Yeah, it's your left, still your left. Um, then you'll see that in this intermediate risk group, which is that large number, 35.6 there, um, it's really they've re removed all the high-risk patients that we talked about. Uh, and really what they have are only patients that have, um, that have pain refractory to, um, to treatment um, or refractory hypertension as well. And there's a huge difference in the mortality rate between that and the low-risk group. You can also see as the age goes up, the mortality rates go up across the board. Um, acute uncomplicated, uh, whether you can see this is a population trial from, uh, or study from uh, Sweden, and you can see that the, uh, the follow-up, uh, there is a significant uh, number of uh, uh, patients that have dissection-related mortalities and acute aortic events um, who have aortic dissections in the uncomplicated group. Um, again, here looking at uh, what happens to type Bs over time. So what we've always done, I taught, said, like my first slide said that we basically define them into acute and chronic. And here for the IRAD study, they looked at it and, and defined it a little bit differently into the hyperacute, the acute, the subacute, and the chronic. And because there are some inflection points where uh, patients uh, seem to, to die a little more frequently. And if you look at it uh, as far as the uh, man three management types, medical management only, um, they do obviously much better than surgical management, and endovas endovascular management does even better than that. If you look at uh, the studies, uh, essentially comparing medical therapy versus TVAR for acute type B dissections, early mortality favors medical therapy. Uh, open surgery versus TVAR favors TVAR, not surprisingly. Uh, initial medical therapy, maintain your systolic blood pressure 100 120, maintain your heart rate lower than 60. Uh, that reduces your secondary events. Uh, and then from the IRAD data, 73% of the patients um, manage, are managed conservatively, 10% in hospital mortality overall, 60 to 80% survival rate at 4 to 5 years, and 40 to 45% survival rate at 10 years. Uh, timing of stent grafting, uh, the earlier you do it, the better. Um, you, you tend to have a uh, remodeling that's much, much better in, in those patients um, than in the more chronic patients. Uh, this is one of the trials you should know about, the INSTEAD trial. Uh, there are only a few dissection trials you need to know about. This is one of them. And essentially what it showed was that there was really no difference in all-cause deaths, two-year survival with medical therapy versus TVAR. Uh, Aorta-related death was uh, not different. And then finally, aortic remodeling was the only thing that was actually better. The ADSORB trial, which was a, a trial ran by, run by Gore, and essentially the primary study endpoint was incomplete or no false lumen thrombosis at one year, a, one year aortic dilatation, uh, descending thoracic or abdominal aortic rupture through the uh, one-year follow-up visit. 
And essentially what it showed, if you take TAG plus best medical therapy, which is in the, uh, the green uh, uh, chart there, uh, you can see that there is um, obviously much better true lumen over time, not surprisingly. Uh, there's also uh, less false lumen. And then overall, you see a definite improvement with the uh, stent graft. Uh, so in conclusion, I think it's a relatively rare pathology, but it has grave consequences. Uh, medical therapy across the board, um, and that includes your type A's. And then endovascular repair is better than open repair in acute type B dissections. But you need to be aware of what's actually happening in the aorta. There are a lot of moving parts, and uh, probably find some ways uh, in using the imaging that's available to improve your, your diagnosis. And then open surgical repair, obviously, is still an option in chronic dissections. Thank you.